please allow me to welcome and introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Mohamed Wahba. Uh, Dr. Wahba is a senior consultant in anesthesia and intensive care, Medina Zaid Hospital, Al Dafra, Abu Dhabi. Um, he's got long standing history in anesthesia. Uh, Arab board certified in anesthesia, uh, diploma in anesthesia, the Royal College of Anesthetists, UK, a master's degree of anesthesia, Cairo University. He's an ACLS instructor in the American Heart Association. Besides his uh, activity on the publication side and the international lecturing side. Today, he will be presenting uh, a, a very interesting lecture, which I do believe is a dilemma in the daily anesthetic practice. It's the um, anesthetic management of patients with a cardiac stent for non-cardiac uh, surgery. Uh, Dr. Wahba, um, please go ahead. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Good night, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. It is a great opportunity for me to be among this um, uh, group of brilliant uh, standard, high standard of um, consultants, senior consultants and professors from Egypt and everywhere else. Uh, to come and join Dr. Saad Mahdi for this beautiful uh, uh, mega online service to help all my colleagues for anesthesia and intensive care. And uh, it was a very short notice actually. Uh, Dr. Saad Mahdi asked me in uh, four days just to come and give a presentation. And um, honestly, this presentation I uh, spoke about two weeks ago with my colleague, Dr. Yasser Zaghloul in anesthesia club meeting, because it is a dilemma for um, how to anesthetize a patient uh, with a stent going for non-cardiac like hernia repair or craniotomy or uh, uh, major abdominal operation or spine surgery or prostate even. Uh, so uh, it is a dilemma of uh, what to do, how to do, and uh, how to provide a safe conduct of anesthesia for uh, those type of patients. Um, First of all, I have nothing to disclose. Um, my plan for, uh, for the presentation will be a short history about the stent development, uh, indication of uh, the stent, clinical assessment to identify the high-risk patients, uh, which is very important because you need to know if that patient is going to end safely out from your anesthesia or he need to be admitted in ICU for further management. And uh, the huge dilemma of the dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, why it is dual? Why not one antiplatelet therapy? This is a very important issue. We'll discuss it and we'll explain it in very simple term. Uh, then the guidelines from anesthesia and surgery. Uh, what is the guidelines? How to implement those guidelines? And uh, the perioperative management of patients with uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. When shall I start? What type of, uh, uh, of procedure? And uh, how can I stop it? When can I restart it again? And so on. So let's start. The introduction for uh, uh, the uh, stent development came out when uh, the amount of the morbidity and mortality of the patient with coronary artery disease has been increasing dramatically. And you can imagine that one death every minute uh, of the coronary artery disease happen all over the world. Uh, the development of the uh, PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention, is widely used to treat coronary artery disease patients. Imagine 600 yearly PCI done, and 80% of them will have a stent. That means you will soon see a patient in your list with stent going for non-cardiac surgery. Uh, and you will start asking you thousands of questions about the safety, will I survive? What is the precaution requirement? And uh, is it really needed or indicated for me to do? And so on. It is actually a unique challenge for the anesthesia and surgery. And that's why we are going to give you a small hint about how the stent develops. The stent development 
based on uh, a metal or plastic tubing inserted into the lumen. That lumen could be anything. Lumen could be trachea, could be esophagus, could be ureter, could be aorta, could be coronary artery. Uh, aim of that stent is to keep that lumen patent, prevent uh, the obstructions and allowing a distal runoff. So the first one to develop this was Thomas, Charles Thomas stent. His name was taken as the landmark for the stent development. That was 200 years ago. He is the British uh, dentist and he used uh, a, a, a recipe of uh, uh, glue from the trees plus talc powder just to fill up the space between the teeth after uh, root canaling and all this stuff. This was 200 years ago. And based on that, her, his family used his name to sail it as the tar, uh, kind of uh, uh, landmark for the stent all over the world later on. Then in 1977, a British uh, physician, not a British, sorry, a German physician in 1977 from the Zurich University, he implemented the balloon angioplasty. The balloon angioplasty based on a metal scaffold with the balloon tip part. This balloon is dilated uh, frequently in and out, so it will allow the dilatation of the stenosed part, which will allow the distal runoff and the prevented the stenosis from happening. Imagine this, 1977, he get a Nobel Prize for it, allowing the distal runoff of the blood flow after the stenosed part. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Andres Grunzing did not succeed at all after that because he only dilate, open the stenosed blood vessels and uh, the trauma of the vessel dilatation will lead to stenosis later on. So 25% to 30% was stenosed after that and the symptoms recur back again till the development of the bare metal stent came to the market in the 1980, which get the approval by the FDA in 1993 with a metal scaffold dilated on the balloon and allowing to that stent part to stay in the stenosed part, keeping it patent and preventing the stenosis again. That was good, beautiful. But unfortunately, that metal stent, which came in and allowing the friction between the blood component and that metal part initiate again the aggregation of the platelets and allowing the stent re stenosis again. So we did not succeed at all because the symptoms recur in about 25% of those patients. Till year 2000, when a drug eluting stent, a new type, of a stent came, which has a, got a coat of anti-proliferative agents. These anti-proliferative agents allow the smooth flow between the blood component with the stream flow of the blood, preventing the friction and the re stenosis of the uh, uh, reopened stenosed part again. Great. That is uh, preventing the and preventing the block cell proliferation. The drug eluting stent went into three stages. First, the stage came at year 2000 and get the approval by the FDA in year 2003, which is drug embedded stainless steel with anti proliferative agents with immunosuppressant to prevent the re stenosis and reduce the complications from 30 to 5%. Then at year 2005, five years later, another generations of the drug eluting stent with cobalt or platinum uh, plated with uh, chromium. This is more efficient, more thin, more flexible and easily navigate through the 
uh, narrow blood vessels and allowing the better reaching of to the stenosed blood vessels and they stay there permanently without any uh, stenosis later on because of the proliferative agents which we painted as you can see now this is the slowly released drugs to block the cell proliferations so allowing the smooth flow of the blood component preventing the friction of the blood component and the metal part or the stem top part that was allowing the smooth flow without uh, uh, stenosis again which is called the anti-proliferative agents but this thing will not be active as you can see now unless four months has to be elapsed between the insertion of the stent till fully functioning that means the patient should receive dual antiplatelet therapy till the four months allow that sort of epithelization of the stent allowing the smooth flow of the blood component without friction anymore so that was the second generations of the uh, drug eluting stent but nothing stops against the revolution the new generations of bioabsorbable polymer came to the market in year 2015. Unfortunately, it is thicker and re stenosed again, recoil, and the poor outcome, especially in the small coronaries. So it did not build up a good reputation like the first or the second generations of the drug eluting stent because of the recoiling again and cannot navigate into the small vein, uh, veins or coronaries or whatever uh, the, in, the lumen you are inserted in. That's the pictures of the, the one on the left side is the new generation year 2015. And the thin one on the right side is the uh, second generation's uh, drug eluting stent. Okay, now, uh, unfortunately in two years later, the FDA sent an, uh, a warning letter to all the cardiologists and all the patient who received the bioabsorbable uh, uh, stent and tell them, unfortunately, you will not be treated anymore uh, with this type of stent because it has major adverse cardiac event. This is a big statement, major adverse cardiac uh, event like myocardial infarction or stroke or something like that. So with that type, uh, the drug, the, the third, the new generations, third generations of the drug eluting stent stopped. So we end up with the first and the second one. Now let's talk about for these first four months till the epicellization developed, what I should have to do for my patient. Dual antiplatelet therapy. Dual antiplatelet therapy is a combination of two antiplatelet therapy, which is considered as the cornerstone of the antithrombotic prophylaxis for the patient with the coronary stent. The very common medications you see in the market, Plavix or Clopidogrel and Aspirin, uh, these are the two uh, antiplatelet therapy. So the question is two, yes, two antiplatelet therapy, not one. Why two? I will tell you. Aspirin is the thromboxane inhibitors. That is the patient. When he, when he is had a stent, he will use aspirin for life. The dose is starting from 75 milligram or 81 milligram or maximum of 100 milligrams once daily for life. The second medicine is the Plavix or clopidogrel, it is the receptor inhibitor or the receptor blocker. It causes irreversible platelet inhibition. But the question is why two together? And uh, can I use heparin? The answer is no. 
Why? Because heparin will allow the paradoxical platelet aggregation. It works on different pathway for the cascade, uh, insignificant platelet, antiplatelet effect, and work on the factors 9, 10, 11, 12, antithrombin 3. Okay, can I use warfarin? Exactly the same question, the same answer, no, because it works on factor 2, 7, 9, and 10. Now, what is the aspirin do as an antiplatelet therapy? Aspirin has the ability to go inside the platelets and the preventing the uh, COX enzyme, preventing the blood clot, preventing the combination of the COX enzyme and the activations of the glycoprotein inside the platelets to stimulate the receptors to be ready for agglutination or aggregation together. But aspirin will not be able to do so alone. That's why it needs another medicine, medicine like clopidogrel. Both of them work on two different receptor sites of the platelets that both together will inhibit the platelet aggregation. Uh, clopidogrel is an antiplatelet aggregation inhibition. As you can see that those medicine together work to prevent the platelets for aggregated and produce its aggregation effect. That is clear now. So we should have two antiplatelet uh, medication, uh, aspirin and the clopidogrel. What is your job? Preoperative anesthesia considerations. So what can I do? And how can I have uh, guidelines for this or not? Because I am in dilemma between maintaining the antithrombotic therapy, which may increase the surgical bleeding, or I can hold the therapy and that may predispose to the patient in, uh, to the risk of ischemia. So what shall I do? The answer is guidelines. Let's go to the guidelines. Do we have guidelines? Honestly, no, we don't have a guidelines from 1993 till year 2000, there was no guidelines. The base, uh, the basic uh, thinking and suggestion was uh, based on the number of the cases which shows complications after having the stent. So in the early 2000s, after reporting some morbidity uh, for the patient after six weeks of the stent, they aggregated together and said, the American Heart Association and the American Society of Cardiology sat together and said by their own thinking only that elective surgery should be waited after six weeks to do the non-cardiac surgery or non-cardiac surgery for those patients. Based on the complication developing, some of them can develop morbidity and complication for 25 to 30%, as I said early on. That is year 2002, and in year 2003, 290 cases reported thrombosis again with the drug eluting stent. That makes the, the combination of the American Heart Association and the American Society of Cardiologists to say again and say, no, 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 that six weeks was not acceptable at all, and better to give one year after the stent insertion for the DOL antiplatelet to work and the patients to be having good epithelization. That was beautiful because the complications stopped completely after they gave a big wide range of one year after the stent insertion. Good, yes, but unfortunately, the number of the cases accumulated uh, all over the world, mainly in the USA, because I got this presentation uh, from the American Heart Associations, uh, uh, the number of the cases was increasing dramatically, waiting list was huge. So they came up with a, a clinical assessment for those patients who might develop major cardiac events and they categorized them into cardiac risk index and non-cardiac risk index. In the clinical assessment for the cardiac risk index, they have six points. <clears throat> Each point of those will have either yes or no, or zero and one, like high risk type of surgery. What type of high risk cardiac surgery? It is a intracranial procedure or spinal uh, procedure or prostate 
or middle ear surgery, aortic surgery, or uh, uh, tumor resection laparotomies. That will take one. History of ischemic heart disease. Did he develop ischemic heart disease in the last six months? Zero or one. History of congestive heart failure. Did he have congested neck veins, pretty edema, or enlarged tender liver? Zero or one. CVA development in the last six months, zero or one. Preoperative treatment with insulin. Imagine preoperative treatment with insulin is considered as high risk. The oral hypoglycemic is not. Insulin is a high risk patient. Preoperative serum creatinine more than two. All these six points will take zero to one and they divide them into groups. If you have one point, it is mild. If you have more than one point, this is moderate to severe. And if you are between moderate and severe, those patient is considered is high cardiac risk index. That means I stop surgery for them or I do it with precautions. No, you will do it with precautions which will be mentioned later on. Symptom, symptoms and signs of unstable cardiac disease. From the cardiac point of view, look to the myocardial ischemia with minimal exertion. If the patient can uh, walk a mile without any shortness of breath, this is considered as mild myocardial ischemia, or the patients cannot walk a mile without feeling shortness of breath and stop him from continuously his uh, uh, walking exercise. This is a severe one, which needs more caution. Active congestive heart failure, or symptoms of valvular heart disease, and finally, significant cardiac arrhythmias. All these will be uh, categorizing our patient to a high-risk ones, and which need to have more and the further discussions of what should we do to bridge them, these type of operations, and to have a safe outcome. Uh, surgical procedure, as I mentioned, exercise tolerance. Also, I mentioned this one mile without shortness of breath or not, and approach to those patients. Those patients should be put on an antihypertensive medications, mainly beta blocker. And this beta blocker should be started at least one week before uh, the, uh, the operation to keep the heart rate between 50 and 60 beat per minute. Back to the guidelines. Based on these, the high-risk patients and the American Heart Associations and American Cardiology, so they said one year, which was great, but unfortunately, they keep on the waiting list. So in year 2014, they became more liberal and said enough to have those patients for six months before doing the procedure to them, the non-cardiac procedure. And in year 2017, recently come, they said that between one month for the bare metal stent and six months for the drug eluting stent. Um, this is more liberal, one month only for the drug elute, for the bare metal stent, as you can see, and the six months for the drug eluting stent, which was very liberal for one month after, that is very brave for them. But I have to tell you that the bare metal is not used anymore. They are all concerned about the drug eluting stent. Uh, anyway, guidelines for us as an anesthesiologist, because as I believe that uh, in spite there is a guidelines as an anesthesiologist, you should have your own eye of evaluating your patient and see if he candidate enough pass smoothly without any problems or he need further assessment, optimization, allowing the patients to be safely managed with uh, our anesthetic technique. So as I said, each patient is an individual case and uh, abrupt stop it of the dual antiplatelet will increase the major adverse cardiac event. The stress response to surgery will stimulate the inflammatory mediators and the stress response, stress hormones causes the platelet activation and the vasospasm. It's very high risk for uh, thrombosis and pain of surgery and the stress will add the demand supply mismatch. This is our problems. What shall we do from anesthesia point of view? As usual, you should 
to get the blood cross match ready for you in case of bleeding and a good IV access for the rapid replacement therapy if we need to. A uh, platelet transfusion may be performed four hours after the stoppage of the clopidogrel and the tight hemodynamic control to optimize the demand supply balance and avoid the sheer stress on the coroners. Plain for quick access to the cardiac suite uh, cath lab if needed, because this is a life-threatening procedure. If something goes wrong, you need to have a cardiac cath lab for reopening of that uh, closed stent or something. Uh, regional and the neuroaxial blood is an excellent choice for pain treatment and must be carefully analyzed. What I mean by carefully analyzed is not a contraindication to give regional block, either spinal or uh, epidural or supraclavicular block or any other type of regional block, but it should be analyzed by the best hand, the more senior person, and the ultrasound guided devices, which will allow you to navigate through dangerous structures and avoid injuring the blood vessels and get it from the first shot. So preoperative uh, intensive care. Back to the, our patients. Do we need to admit him in the ICU beforehand? Uh, this is the recommendations uh, of the American Heart Associations for those patients based on the anesthesia team. And as I mentioned, anesthesia team is you. You are the team leader who are controlling everything not the surgeon, because they does not know all this deep physiological and informative uh, way of that stent and the, and the antiplatelet therapy, hemodynamic status of the patients. You are, as an anesthesiologist, is the team leader. Preoperative preparation in the intensive care unit may be benefit certain high-risk patients, particularly those with a decompensated heart failure. Stopping clopidogrel five days before surgery and aspirin one day before the surgery. This is the recommendation of dealing with those patients. When we are talking about six months after the insertion of the stent. Good. Now, the European Society of uh, Cardiology came up with a better revolution to us. They said that uh, you can stop the clopidogrel five days before surgery, but you do not need to stop aspirin at all. You can continue with the aspirin, 75 milligram, 81 milligram, or up to 100 milligram. Really? Yes, this is the new recommendation with the European Society of Cardiology. Excellent. Then, how can I start it again? Immediately or after? One day, two days, three days? The Mayo Clinic Registry did very interesting study. Over 2,400 patients had a cardiac procedure, uh, had the procedure within three years uh, of a stent implantation, and they measure the 30 days major adverse cardiac event rate to them. And they divided them into three groups. Group following the doctor order, the two antiplatelet uh, therapy given to them. One neglected or used one antiplatelet therapy, which was aspirin. And the third group uh, did not take anything at all, forget about anything. He said, no, I'm not going to take any medication. I need to live my life. And out of the, this study on these 2,400 patients, that was the result that the dual antiplatelet therapy, they develop major adverse cardiac event in 5% of the patients. And the one who is taking aspirin alone, they have only 1% side effects or major adverse cardiac event. And the one which neglected completely taking in a medication follow, uh, does not follow the doctor order have 2.3%. This means that uh, the efficacy and effectiveness of the antiplatelet therapy uh, in reducing the perioperative ischemic cardiac event after the coronary stent is not clear. 
to stop, to clear, to start, start on two, start on one. It is very uh, questionable, one. So from us as an anesthesia, what to do? Uh, any anesthesia technique you will perform is acceptable, so long the effective elimination of pain is very important. I read an article a few weeks ago about the multimodal anesthesia. We used to read the multimodal analgesia, use the uh, different type of analgesic pathways and uh, uh, pain treatment. Now we have a multimodal anesthetic technique. You can use a combination between general and uh, epidural, spinal general, uh, general with the infusions, uh, TIVA and uh, uh, infusions of uh, pain treatment. So it is your choice to do whatever you like. So long you have to care about the hemodynamic of the patient. You have to take care of pain treatment. We under, we all, all of us underestimating the pain of the patients. I don't know why this is a habit uh, of feeling afraid of giving good analgesia to the patients for to wake, make them uh, wake up early. Anyway, the choice is left to you and the anesthesia team to decide. Opioid-based anesthesia is very acceptable. Uh, because of the cardiovascular stability, but be aware that you might need to post-operative ventilation. I mentioned major adverse cardiac effects several times. What is the major adverse cardiac effect? This is an effect which happened 30 days after the non-cardiac procedure for patients who have a stent, like MI, like stroke, like heart failure, like even death. Uh, those happened after 30 days of non-cardiac surgery. What is the predisposing for those major adverse cardiac event? Uh, as I said, if we did not follow up what is the risk factors like congestive heart failure or stroke or MI or hypertension or diabetes on insulin or the acute kidney uh, insufficiency, that will give you one score. And we said, one is mild, two and above is severe, which will predispose to the major adverse cardiac effect. Now the complication will, will, will come now. If you did not do elective surgery, do it on emergency basis, or patient has a history of MI less than six months, or the cardiac risk factor uh, is more than two, those will develop major adverse cardiac effect uh, events. So in conclusion, to stop this dilemma, 15 to 25% of the patients with a coronary stent present for non-cardiac surgery within one to five years, congratulations, expect one patient every week in your clinic coming with the stent going for non-cardiac surgery. Those patients present with a unique set of challenge in the perioperative period and are predisposed to the high risk of the perioperative major adverse cardiac event. The recommendations of the dual antiplatelet therapy is to delay the non-cardiac elective surgery at least six months after the stent placement. At the present time, preoperative evaluation should focus on identifying the patient with symptoms and without symptoms of coronary artery disease and the exercise capacity of those patients. Guidelines are helpful, but cannot be followed blindly. Each decision must be individualized with a careful risk benefit assessment of bleeding, ischemic complications, and the consequences of delaying surgery. With this slide, I came to the end of my presentation, and this is my reference. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share with uh, Mega uh, online for anesthesia. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Um, I myself really enjoyed uh, this lecture. Uh, comprehensive, detailed, yet simple, giving us each and every key we need for a cardiac patient with stent surgery. Uh, from my fan, from the comments that everybody's uh, agreeing with me for the marvelous lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, 
because it has been a very clear, simple, to the point lecture. We don't have many questions. La, 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 la. That makes me very, very unhappy. No questions means either they did not understand anything or they understand everything. I can assure you, you made it really to the point. <laughs> Simple take home message. I think it would be like, you know, uh, practical for every anesthesia doctor to know in his mind what to do for a patient with a stent undergoing a mind cardiac surgery. I have um, a couple of questions. One of them, I don't know if it's in the scope of the lecture, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, it's from Dr. Sharif Abdul Latif. He's asking, what is the recommendation for elective non-cardiac surgery post cabbage surgery? Coronary artery oh, not stand. No, I cannot I answer that question out. because I'm not a cardiac anesthetist. Yes. So I will. So uh, I think this. Out or, excuse me, I cannot answer that question. Yeah, it's out of scope. <laughs> I, I decided, but yeah. I thought. Why not to ask it? Another question, uh, one to stop anticoagulant for the stent, even if the patient is not going to for surgery, I think. Great, this is a beautiful question. Why? Because you are not going to count for your whole life on these two double antiplatelet therapy. The only uh, uh, clopidogrel used for the first six months only. After that, you will be on aspirin daily, uh, one tablet for life. So we are not going to use the clopidogrel again. Only aspirin. Yes. To make your life easy. Uh, another question. Uh, what about the essential surgery, like cancer surgery, or I, I can add myself like emergency operation? Uh, in a recent stent, if it's less than six months. Is Very good. Helpful? Yeah, I mentioned that on the presentation that the things that could end up with major adverse cardiac event is emergency surgery, not well prepared, as I said, and we cannot stop it because you have got a dilemma. Either you have to allow the tumor to spread or you cut it uh, earlier on with the risk of those patients could have some bleeding and it will be corrected later on in ICU. That's why the preoperative assessment and ICU admission one or two days before and evaluate the patient among the team. The team is not only the anesthesiologist and the surgeon, it is the cardiologist, is the internal medicine doctors, and it is called the, the, the team for treatment. Those should sit together. What shall I do to allow the safe coverage of those patients, which I am expecting that he will have a major adverse cardiac effect because he's not fulfilled the requirement of doing the safe surgery for him at that time. It is less than six months. Patient who could be having a bleeding, I need to stop the clopidogrel for him uh, and start it again. And there is no bridging with a, with a heparin and the warfarin. Please do not uh, get uh, confused. There is no place for heparin at mm -hmm. all uh, because the pathway for the clotting is different uh, than the initiation of the uh, platelet aggregation. Mm -hmm. uh, that is why we give platelet uh, in the ICU postoperative if there is a bleeding and give blood if there is a bleeding, of course, to maintain the oxygen carrying capacity. And later on, uh, hemodynamical stability with some inotropes to allow this patient. And I think Dr. Uh, Samir Al-Ansari could better uh, answer that question for the hemodynamic stability of those patients later on after the operation. Mm -hmm. But uh, please, you have to know that this patient with less than six months will definitely have a major adverse cardiac event, maybe have a CVA, maybe could end up with a uh, bleeding, maybe could have heart failure because the heart will not be able to pump the blood beautifully and intraoperatively. That's why the role of the ICU intensive care is the hand-in-hand uh, -hand with the anesthesiologist to allow the safe, smooth pass from that critical stage of the patient. Thank you very much for this. A couple of more questions, if you don't mind. Uh, By all means, yes. <laughs> now they understand uh, the multiplication. Yes, I think they are just <laughs> setting the information in mind. Uh, what about bridging? Uh, I mean, the question, uh, what I understood is that if the patient is six months after the stent and he stopped the tool antiplated and he's on single antiplated, should we start bridging again if he's going through the procedure? Like, as thing, I think the question is that the stress of the surgery, the pain, 
to restart again the bridging or once it stops, we don't go back to it again? Uh, as I was mentioning, this is the European Society of uh, Cardiology made it very clear in the, in the graph that you stop the clock pedogrel five days before the procedure, aspirin do not need to stop it, and immediately after the patient finished the surgery, admitted in ICU, restart the clock pedogrel again. I think the question is if the patient has already stopped the clock pedogrel with six months after the stent. So post-operative, should we start clopidogrel again or once we no, stop? No, 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 okay. no, 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 what is an intravenous antiplatelets? I did not understand. Uh, intravenous, um, uh, like the, there is the agent that act, which acts like the agarix, which works in like, I think, six hours or something like this. If needed. I don't know. <laughs> I can, I don't know. Okay. Uh, any check angiogram required preoperatively in any patient? Uh, angiogram for what? Uh, cardiac angiogram, I mean, I think, yes. Do we need of like course, this? these patients should be, yes, should be, have a coronary angio. They should have the uh, ultrasound, uh, transesophageal echo, if possible, and to evaluate the cardiac status of that patient. Mm -hmm. It should be done before. This is part of the uh, uh, preemptive evaluation of those patients before doing that surgery. He is a still a high-risk patient. Thank you very much. I think one last... Uh, question or asking about opinion. Uh, Mr. Wahba Bakit is asking, some surgeons can't work on aspirin as they are working in a closed space. Can? Cannot work on aspirin. They can't operate with the patient who's going on aspirin. Yes, this is, as I said, this, this type of, uh, of patient's middle ear surgery because any drop of blood is like an ocean. Uh, so it is also mutual agreement between mm -hmm. the anesthesiologist, which is the team leader, and the surgeon to explain to him that it can be done, but uh, if we can, if you want us to stop the aspirin for those patients, we have no issue. The aspirin should be stopped immediately before the procedure. It is not like uh, one day before or five days before or something like that. Because we are working about a small dose of aspirin. This is 75 milligrams. Uh, I think we're done with the questions. Thank you very much. I think, uh, Dr. Huda, if you don't mind me to sure. answer uh, one question here. Yes. Uh, what is the recommendation for elective non-cardiac surgery with cabbage? I, I, it depends on the patient if he has, uh, if he's been on Bilafix or aspirin or whatever, will follow the rules exactly the same. Um, Bilafix could be stopped five days before surgery, aspirin to continue the day before surgery. And they don't, they don't have essentially to be in critical situation because we suppose a patient uh, post cabbage, they improved as regards the cardiac function. <clears throat> Um, as regard the uh, bridging or not bridging, I believe uh, every hospital should have a protocol and the guidelines, its own guidelines and protocol and the pre-operative assessment. And uh, uh, every patient, as Dr. Waba said, that every patient should be individualized and debris assessed and the, as he's the only patient you care for. Uh, following guidelines from all over the world, internationally and nationally and locally, are extremely important. The, the last point I would like to highlight, um, the patient himself should be as well consulted and, uh, and uh, uh, included in that discussion. I believe we do that here in my practice. I, I talk to the patient really, I explain to him the risk and the benefit uh, for what we're doing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saad. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you. Dr. Excellent Dr. lecture, Dr. Wahba. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we all were refreshed by this.